I have a very easy, you would think, job to do now because I get to talk about something I work on that I like working on and that people love using. So it should be very, very easy to talk about this and please the crowd. The one snag to this is most of this is probably not my work because there's a large team of people who work on Binder and all the things related to it. And you want to, you know, the, the weight on my shoulders is to do them justice and all the work and time that they've invested. So this makes it, for me, a very hard talk to give. So before I tell you what Binder is, which is a, you know, the one sentence version that you can tweet is, Binder is a tool for sharing notebooks with other people. Um, but if you want a more detailed version of what that means, we have to go back about 5,000 years in history to when humans first started creating libraries. And you will hopefully see by the end of the talk why that is a useful excursion to take. And don't worry, we will manage to come back to the present uh, in time for the drinks reception. So. 5,000 years ago, the Sumer people who lived in modern-day southern Iraq um, started writing down who is trading with who and stories about the history of their people on these clay tablets and collecting them in what we would call a library. And so 5,000 years ago, we already realized that writing things down so that other people can find them and read them, we can share them with each other, is a useful thing to be doing. So it was quite difficult back then because these clay tablets, you know, there's very dense text on it. You had to wait for it to be, you know, not too wet, but not too dry, and then fit the whole story into it. Um, it's kind of thick, so it's probably quite heavy as well. Um, but people thought this was a good idea, a good thing to do, and they built libraries that archaeologists can now discover. And what I find amazing is they're kind of thick, they, you write on the front, and then you store them in shelves, like this, with the writing on the front, and next to each other, and then you can't read anymore what's written on it, so what do you do? You write on the thick side of it a title for it, and if you ask me, that looks very much like a book already, you know, about 5,000 years ago, so I thought that was interesting. So then we invented paper, then we invented the printing press, so we could make actual books, like we recognize them now. Libraries changed a little bit, they started looking like this, and you can now express much more complicated ideas because you're not limited to one page. You can have lots of pages in a book in about the same volume as uh, one clay tablet. And now people also realize that, so I don't know what came first, but producing a book was kind of expensive, so you would limit access to it. To get into a library back in the olden days, you had to prove that you were you know, a gentleman and scholar and you had money to buy your way in. Um, so this controlling knowledge, you know, if, if you're slightly more cynical, then you think this is an attempt to control the knowledge, not just to protect the books. Um, yeah, so then you know, books became cheaper and cheaper and there was more and more knowledge and we now have fantastic modern buildings that look like this, that house libraries. We let school children go there and lend books and feed them to their dogs so that they can claim that uh, they couldn't do their homework. Um, and when I was a student, I used to go to the library quite a lot, but I wasn't going there necessarily because of the physical books they had. I was going there because you had to read articles and digital versions of books. So then, you know, now the library can store infinite amount of knowledge because a PDF doesn't take very much space. Um, but fundamentally, they're still storing the same kind of thing. It's still a page, it's still a piece of paper, even if it's a web page or a PDF. And then the next thing that happened, if you look at this article that you might want to read about a topical science society related issue, most of what you see on this page actually has nothing to do with the content of the article. It's just different ways of logging in so that you can read it. 
Um, so now libraries are doing two things. They curate knowledge, so they pick for me what is interesting and what is not so interesting, but they also broker access to these articles, which in some sense is what they have been doing for a long time as well. And so the next problem is modern day ideas now, I would claim are too complicated to be expressed on a piece of paper, even if it's a web page. You know, a piece of paper here is something which is static. You have some kind of text and pictures on it, but you know, it's fundamentally the same thing as a clay tablet. And what do I, you know, to give you an example of why I think it's important to think about this is imagine all I could use is words to explain to you a law of physics, so Newton's third law. And if I can only use words to do that, then it would read something like this. The third law states that all forces between two objects exist in equal magnitude and opposite direction. If one object A exerts a force FA on a second object B, then B simultaneously exerts a force FB on A, and the two forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So that's a lot of text. It takes a very long time to read, and it's probably not super precise either. So if you're a physicist, you might have lots of questions about what exactly uh, this law entails. So in physics, then, we use a different medium. We don't use words. We use maths. And this has two good advantages. Uh, one of them is much shorter. So F sub A equal minus F sub B. Uh, is the same amount, or I would say is even more information than that long text. And it's definitely much more precise. So if different physicist wants to know exactly what you mean, if you show them this equation, they will be much happier than if you show them the text. And I think the same applies to modern day ideas everywhere else, you know, especially in fields like machine learning or data science and journalism. If you just show me the text about what you did, I will still have a lot of questions. I need much more than uh, just the text. So then you could say, well, is paper obsolete? And this is a headline or the, the teaser picture from an article published in The Atlantic, written or co-written, I think, by some of the Jupiter people, where they claim that, indeed, the scientific article is obsolete. But I think. You should take a moment to think about that kind of claim because it is a bold statement. After all, paper has been the market leader in information transmission for 5,000 years. So if you want to put that out of business, you better have some good uh, examples. So if we want to go beyond paper, then let me show you an example about this. So this is a research article which came out in July 2018, and it discusses an idea about um, machine learning. And if you want like, the very high level I, like, uh, summary of what they're doing, they have images, like this little image here. And they want you to be able to ask questions written as text um, and give you answers about you know, what you're asking given that image. So in this image, they ask, how many large metal cylinders are there in the image? And the answer is two. Um, and you know, that might not be super interesting to you. But if you're a researcher into, in machine learning, if you read this whole paper, you will still have questions. Now, it's not enough just to have the, the paper. So luckily, the authors published all their code on GitHub. And I think that's the equivalent for most of modern science of what maths is to physics is this is really what they actually did and if you want to know exactly what they did when they write you know we took images and rotated them then going and looking at their code is probably the way to find out what they very you know actually did so what we want to do if we want to understand their paper and make progress on building on top of it or reusing it or even just understanding it for understanding's sake, we need to run this code. And who here wants to attempt to download this code and install all the cutting edge research 
libraries required to run their code? Anybody? <laughs> no? How, how, how long do you think? I will ask you several time frames uh, in a row now. So how long do you think it will take you to reproduce like one figure from their paper? One day. Anybody? Two days? One week? Less than one day, anybody? Yeah, but you see, this is a, a large amount of time. Um, and I, um, you know, it, it, should take, it should take seconds, maybe minutes, to, to try at least reproduce what they did. Because most of the time, if you have to set aside a whole afternoon, a whole day, you're going to put it on your to-do list. And this is what I like to call the list of things to do when I finally have spare time again. And that already tells you when you will get to it, essentially never. So luckily, there is a tool called Binder that will let you click a link. And if it all works, we will be able to reproduce their figure within a few seconds. So what, just, what did you just see? You saw a spinner. And while that was spinning, we pulled the code from GitHub, built a Docker image for that code, stuffed the code in it, launched the Docker image somewhere in the Google Cloud, set up some proxy routes so that in my browser, I can see the notebook that is in the GitHub repo, and I can now run it. So now I have to spend a little bit of time, or I spent a little bit of time ahead of the talk figuring out which parts of this code are actually interesting. So you see here they give the, the code to reproduce figure one. And if you run it, you will get figure one. And it even, it even prints out the answer. So now, maybe in a few minutes, if we add back in the time of reading the code and trying to figure out what it actually, what, what part of it we need to run. Within a few minutes, we can reproduce that figure. And even cooler is, we can now go and say, well, I'm interested in rubber cylinders because who cares about uh, metal cylinders? And we can rerun it. Yeah, and apparently, there's one rubber cylinder in this image. So now, as somebody who is interested in machine learning and you know, don't, doesn't believe any researcher uh, when they say anything in their paper and thinks, yeah, you just cherry picked that example, I'm already much more convinced that this works. Oh, and maybe if I am in the business of finding rubber cylinders and images, uh, I'm now thinking, well, maybe I should investigate this kind of uh, this project further because I can show to myself that not only can I reproduce their figures, but I can also do small modifications. And now it's worth spending hours and hours and days figuring out how their code really works. And I think that is why just having a piece of paper these days is not enough for um, communicating scientific ideas to people. And that is Binder. No, the magic behind you being able to click a link and having it run in your browser without having to set up anything, this is what Binder does. And ideally, this means you don't actually see very much of Binder because you will get a link that you click and then you get a notebook and uh, that's it. So an alternative title for this talk would have been running other people's code. And that, if you ask most people, they would not complete the sentence like this. Um, so this is an XKCD comic, I think, purely about figuring out which version of Python you might or might not have installed on your Mac. So you know, if you can draw humorous comics about just one executable, imagine what it looks like. Uh, if you have more complicated stuff. So there's several approaches you could take to trying to make it easier to share work. You could take what I call the IT department approach, where you say, OK, we decide all tools you're allowed to use, what version of them. It's locked down. You cannot install anything new. You can't uninstall anything either. Uh, that's it. Deal with it. And that's quite 
you know, as a big corporation, that's a potentially reasonable approach to take because all of your employees will have exactly the same tools and they can send code to each other and that will fix that problem. As the disadvantage that if you want to do cutting edge research, you probably want to have like the latest and greatest of whatever tool you want to use and you don't want to have to ring up your IT department who will say, oh yeah, we'll have to audit it and then come back in six months time. Um, and you're like, well, I don't have time for this. So in research, much more uh, frequently, you have the Wild West approach where anybody or everybody chooses what they want to do uh, without any coordination with others. And then the problem is you need to exchange emails for weeks on trying to figure out which hidden variable somewhere uh, allows them to run their code and stops you from doing this. And one solution to this uh, problem is that you ship everything. Yeah, so you build a ginormous virtual machine and tell people, yeah, just download this 20 gig thing and then you will be able to run my code. And then unsurprisingly, not very many people do that. So you can do maybe a little bit better with something like Docker then you only send a 10 gigabyte image to people. but. You know, you probably still need heavy lifting equipment like this. So if you're interested, this is, I think, the biggest lifting boat or ship in the world. And it's, you know, it submerses itself and then floats underneath the drilling platform and then it lifts it out and transports it around the world. So approximately that level of heavy lifting you will need. You know? So there's another way, which I call the IKEA manual approach. So I send you a manual that instructs you on how to construct the environment in which the code runs. And the IKEA manual can be followed by most people in the world to build surprisingly sophisticated furniture, even though none of us know anything about building furniture. So in, uh, you know, back in the computer world, then this is called Docker files which I think is, uh, or in Binder, we think is the best approach of how to share with other people, how to construct the environment in which to run uh, your code. So there's one problem with Docker files. Uh, they, they are text files, so when you write the commands you want to have executed in them. So crafting good Docker files requires a surprising amount of uh, skill and expertise that most people don't have. Now, so the, I wouldn't say correct, but a very good way to install a tool called less is these six lines of code in your Docker file. And not very many people know that you should probably write all of this. And certainly most people wouldn't write all of this every time they construct a Docker file. So in some sense, that is like writing down stuff on clay tablets. In principle, it's possible to write, you know, war and peace on clay tablets, in practice, you're probably not going to do it. So how did that paper do it? How did Binder uh, perform that miracle? And if you have very good eyes, you can see um, that there's nothing special in this GitHub repo. There are no files in there that you wouldn't normally find there. So. The tool we use to build these Docker containers for you is called repo to Docker. And it does exactly what the name suggests it does. It takes a repository and turns it into a Docker container. And repo to Docker uh, runs and builds containers. And it does what a human would do. So step one, it clones the repository. And then it analyzes the repository. And it looks for files that it recognizes. So in this case, there's an environment.yaml. And that describes the dependencies of the project. And repo to docker knows what to do with that file and what other things it needs to do in addition to uh, just having that file there. So in this case, it runs conda install, and then it runs Jupyter Notebook. And if you do this, you will get a Jupyter Notebook if the people who authored the repository cooperated a little bit. So if they don't put all their dependencies in the environment.yaml, we will be out of luck. But if they share a link with you that they say, just click this and it will work, and it doesn't, then it's very clear who has some homework to do. You, know, you just email them back and say it doesn't work. Whereas normally when they send you instructions, then it's completely unclear, or 
most of the time, they will claim that you can't follow the instruction or you didn't follow the instructions correctly and you have to go, no, 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 I really did it. And, you know, you then have a meta argument about how to get their stuff running. And the nice thing about repo to Docker is we constructed it so that it understands what you're already doing. Now, it's a little bit like in a magic trick when I said, there's nothing suspicious about this repo. You already knew that I was going to tell you that actually there is. Um, so repo to Docker understands lots of files that specify what dependencies to install that people are already using. So requirements.txt, environment.yaml, um, require in all caps if you speak Julia. Um, it also has a few files that we had to invent ourselves because we couldn't find something somebody else was already using. And it makes us a little bit sad, but there you go. It also has an escape hatch. So if you really know what you're doing or you think you know what you're doing and you're special, then you can put a Docker file there and it will just build it. But most people find they don't actually have to do that. So back to sharing. So we can run repo to Docker with a link to a URL on our laptop and that will do exactly what I showed you. So you need to exchange emails which are a little bit like this uh, to which when I read it, I go like, really, I need to install Docker and then this other tool that I don't know and you know all that. So the question is, can we make it even easier? Maybe just a link you can click. And the answer is, of course, because this is what Binder is all about. So I will not click it again because it will do exactly what it did before. So Binder is, uh, looks like this. If you go to the front page of it, instead of following a link somebody else gave you, and there you type in the URL of a Git repository. So it says GitHub, but in the meantime, it supports any kind of Git repository. If it's hosted on GitLab, if it's a gist, if it's a Git server somewhere, um, I think Bitbucket, things like this. And then you specify which branch or which tag you want to have in your link. And you can, you can specify what file to directly open for them. And it will generate a link for you, and it will also generate the markdown and the rest for you to make a restructured text and make this beautiful badge that you can then put in your readme. Um, yeah. So when somebody follows the link, they will see a spinner like this, and then hopefully they will see a notebook. So how is it put together? Well, we have Jupyter Hub, which you have had the chance to listen to Min talk about uh, just in the previous, no, two slots back. Or if you missed it, then you can watch the video recording on the way home. Um, we can, so JupyterHub is a multi-user uh, notebook server. We combine that with repo to Docker, which builds images on demand. And then we use Kubernetes to uh, orchestrate all of these containers. And if you want to talk more about all these technical things, then find me afterwards. So one other thing the Binder team does is operate a website called mybinder.org, which is our public demo of a Binder hub. And if you want to know how we do all of the operations around that, you should have watched Yuvi's talk at 5 to 12. Uh, or if you missed it, you can watch the video. So the nice thing is that with both repo to docker and uh, my bind or binder hub and mybinder.org you are not limited to jupyter front end so you can use r studio if you want to you can do r shiny bokeh apps app mode uh, basically anything which is a web app you can probably make work in um, binder yeah you can even make web pages so this is the documentation for a python library called spacey they have little bits of code snippets in their documentation that they let you run directly from their web page. And you see the output of running that bit of code. And you can edit it and like, play around with it. And this is backed by uh, mybinder.org. So you don't even, uh, in this case, see that uh, binder is involved. OK. So now you know about what the project does, you've seen what it's good for. Now I'll talk about the people in the future of the project a little bit. So this is a picture that shows some of the people who contribute to the project, because 
as I said at the very beginning, there's actually a large number of people um, behind this project. And not all of them are on this picture because this picture only captures people who somehow leave a trace in our <laughs> GitHub history. And there's lots of people who do things which are not captured in the GitHub history. And we would love you to join us. So you can come and chat with us on Git, Gitter. You can file issues on the uh, repo. You can make pull requests and change it if you want to. If you're very brave, you can make a pull request to the GitHub repo, which does the operations of uh, mybinder.org. And you can change what mybinder.org does. Um, yeah, so I would welcome you to join us in, in running this. So now the question is, 362 is what? Almost. <laughs> no. So, ooh, maybe, maybe. I, I think actually it's bigger. So no. 362 is the number of unique GitHub repositories launched in the last seven days on mybinder.org. And I looked it up, and we all had a little guess on how big that number would be, and none of us uh, guessed this big. So I find that very impressive, and it makes it very hard to show you who is using mybinder.org, because there are 362 things to choose from. And even if you spend an hour looking at a lot of them, um, you still don't make a lot of progress. Another, what I find very amazing things is, this is a map of the world. And if you set the time frame to 80 days, Binder visits almost every country that Google Analytics recognizes as a country. So there's a few countries missing, you know, places like, uh, I think, uh, Chad, Eritrea, Cuba, North Korea, the Vatican, um, the South Pole, I think, is also missing. But otherwise, we cover basically all countries uh, in the world in just 80 days. And I find that is just amazing. Because if you set it to more than 80 days, we get pretty close to a complete map where everything is blue. Some of the countries only have a few launches, but still, it's pretty amazing. So now is the, the showing off part. Um, there's been 1.2 million binders launched in 2018 so far. Um, and that is missing some people who turn off JavaScript or otherwise opt out of being tracked. So we don't count them. Uh, we launch around 50,000 binders every week. And you know, it would have been great if in time for this talk, the trend from last week where it was over 60,000 would have continued, but somehow it looks like that was a fluke. And we don't know yet who was who was responsible for those extra 10,000. Yeah, so these are some of the, so what I did then is I went in our Google Analytics and I said, okay, from the state of New York in the last 30 days, who used my binder? And there's uh, people from, I don't know, C-U-N-Y Crest or high res This is high school students learning about um, remote sensing. There's uh, the Andean Region Office of Astronomy. They're somewhere in South America. Um, the Flatiron Institute, the Coolridge Initiative. I have no idea what they do. Uh, somebody who has a book about doing math with Python. Yeah, uh, Spacey, I already mentioned. They do uh, natural language processing. And super cool, a few weeks ago, somebody who runs an internal workshop for Microsoft employees came to us and said, we have 100 people in the audience. They will all launch binders simultaneously. Um, what's going to happen? Uh, and we said, well, 100, that's kind of at the limit of how much we allow per repo. Uh, so maybe you want to make two repos, but otherwise it should be fine. Um, yeah, so that's quite cool. So I think we can make a claim that going beyond paper is something we need and that maybe MyBinder is part of this uh, solution of how you make it possible for people to access things which are not just a piece of paper at home or you know, anywhere in the world, really. Yeah, I will, I will just you know, hammer the 
point home that today's ideas, I think, are just inadequately communicated to people if you just have a piece of paper. And libraries have always been about curating and spreading knowledge. So really the fact that it's not a paper-based thing anymore is not a problem. And what I think would be super to happen is if there was a binder hub in every library. Because now anybody who has access to the library can do quite sophisticated things with computers uh, that otherwise maybe they don't have access to. Because if you think about why, you know, if you look at the countries that use MyBinder a lot, they are primarily sorted by population, but then there's a heavy bias away or towards countries where giving away free compute like we do is actually a huge deal. Uh, there's lots of universities who, who use MyBinder.org for their programming courses, and if you look at how big their classes are, it would require quite a lot of infrastructure to give a computer to 80 different students simultaneously, but we just give it to them for free because we have the good fortune of having uh, the Moore Foundation give us money to run this kind of service for the public. So, yeah, if you ask me what is Binder doing in the future, we're going to try and get a Binder hub into every library so that everybody in the world can, you know, understand ideas of modern day life uh, and is not stuck uh, doing that. And so there's one more thing before you can leave, which is you should go to this uh, short link right now. And in exchange, I will show you a graph that you can access yourself. It's completely open. That shows you how many user pods are running currently. And the exercise is going to be to try and make a blip on this graph. Yeah. And I've spent, I've spent all summer giving this talk with increasingly bigger audiences to make sure that I would not be very worried at all standing here telling an audience of I don't know how many people to simultaneously launch a binder and make an upwards trend on this and not also a cause of outage on, on my binder. So with that, thank you very much. So, so we have nine minutes for questions, which means there's no reason for you not to type in the bit.ly link so we can go back at the end and ask lots of questions in the meantime. So we, we're trying to find out who we can ask to fund the cloud bill, we're trying to find out who to talk to who can make the cloud bill go away. Because it is, in the grand scheme of things, I think right now costs about $40,000 a year. So it's not a huge amount of money, but it's also more than we can like, collect uh, by sending a hat round in every talk we give. Um, the other thing that I think is often ignored in the sustainability, you know, especially when we talk about money, is how much it actually costs to have somebody sitting on Gitter or carrying around a phone uh, to respond to an outage. Because once in a while, my binder does go down. Um, and that's a much bigger amount of money that we need to find. And yeah, we're working on it. What can you do to advocate for it? I know, send people our way who would like to donate so we get our uh, move on in being able to accept that kind of donation. I think that would be a good thing to do. So it is super for workshops because you give your attendees a link to click and that's it. If they have a tablet, you know, that works. 
the problem is we don't provide any persistent storage for people, so they need to remember to download everything at the end. And then in principle, at the end of the workshop, they can click on the link again because my binder is hopefully still running. Um, so as long as you host your material somewhere uh, publicly and continue to host it, then your attendees can keep using my binder until we've run out of money. Um, <laughs> No, but, and, and maybe more seriously than the answer is they could use a tool like Creeper to Docker maybe to then also run it on their laptop. Or depending on how complicated it is to set up all the tools you need, you could give them instructions how to set it up without having to use something like Repo to Docker. So there was a, no. Uh, so coming from a business environment, we've definitely done the kitchen sink approach when it comes to sharing notebooks or anything like that. Uh, and so the idea is can, Binder can be used to share uh, information and interact with it, but can that information then be updated, changed, and stored back into where it came from? Yes. Oh, okay. But not on mybinder.org. Okay, not mybinder, but on a... If, if you run your private Binder Hub, okay. then it's not scary for users to type in their passwords, and then they can type git push to push it back to wherever it came from. There's no UI yet. We're basically waiting for Jupyter Lab to make a nice UI for that, um, and then yeah. But on the on the, on the public MyBinder, we really, really, really don't want people to type in any credentials. Some people seem to do it, but we really think that's a bad idea. Um, Yeah, so these guys from the Pangeo project, they set up their own binder hub, and they give you even more computational resources than we do. So you can launch, I don't know how big a cluster you can launch on demand, but um, yeah. It looks exactly the same as uh, mybinder.org, but uh, <laughs> I promise it's a different one. So yeah, there we go. So it needs Kubernetes. Right. You need to have a Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Um, the requirements of for that Kubernetes cluster, the features it has to have, are much lower than if you want to set up a Jupyter Hub. But you need to have a Kubernetes cluster. Okay. And then there is a there is a guide that if you have a Jupyter, uh, Kubernetes cluster, how you can get your own binder hub. Does it depend on Conda or not? Or is it on? Does it depend on Conda or just the ability to set up some sort of? Ah, no. So you can re use requirements.txt. Okay. Um, internally, we use Miniconda to provide the Python executable in repo to Docker, just because that's an easy way to install it. Um, but yeah, you can use uh, R. You know, if you're using R, then Conda doesn't come into the game at all. Uh, OK, you first. Uh, so we have a, an example about how to get data into your binder. And it gives you several options. So I recommend you read that. Um, in principle, you can make your Docker image as big as you want. In practice, we would prefer you to make it semi-small-ish. And if you have very large data sets, stream them in as you process them. So there's an example in here for, I think, GeoTIFF or something um, on how to take really big data sets and stream them into mybinder.org. Um, and if you have another example, please contribute it. Yeah. And I create the UI 
So if you don't, so it will only, mybinder.org will only you use public Git repositories as a source. So now your question is, if nobody knows that Git repo exists, and nobody knows the URL, is it still private? Uh, I don't know. But we don't, we don't have a registry. No, we do have a, no, okay, the short answer is it's public. Because that, the, because the, the analytics data is largely public, so if somebody wanted to, they could look through all the binders that have recently been launched, and they would find yours and... So it makes sense that if you have concerns about public data, you should post around... Yes, yes, yes. That's good. So we don't do. Oh wow. Um, so the short answer, oh no, the the thing is, I will go to the reception. So if you have more questions, find me there. Uh, the answer to you is we don't do anything special, but I would personally love it if somebody invested the time to make Jupyter, a Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab or any of the other notebook front ends easier to use from a mobile device, which doesn't have a keyboard. I would love that if somebody did it. Thank you very much.